Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Beth, drunk Beth. Oh, fucking should murder D-Day for giving me that guy. Hey, everyone, this is drunk Beth, and I wanted to start off today's show with um, an apology, because that's such a good, strong Hi, start. Hi, um, this is Beth, and I just wanted to introduce this show, or introduce the introduction of this show, because brevity is not our strong suit. You might notice, once we get into the interview portion of today's episode that the audio sounds like absolute garbage, like rotting baby diaper garbage. So it isn't that we recorded this audio in a metallic bucket. It is that um, I forgot to turn the mixer on (laughs) to the recording thing. I promise you that the next dumb mistake I make with the audio will be completely different than this one. So I'm sorry, and here is D-Day and Rex here to introduce our guest today. So, Rex, today we've got someone on the podcast who is near and dear to my shriveled, blackened, corrupted, sarcastic, sardonic heart. That would be Mr. Andy, a.k.a. Dandy, uh, also known by some lucky few as O-Ring Von Brownflower. To some, yes. (laughs) Um, Not to me. So, uh, when did you get to know Dandy? First week of college in central Pennsylvania, all the way back in 1997. Oh, the hoary days of the middle 90s. Were you both wearing flannel? I believe I had a green and cream flannel back then, which was my favorite flannel. Now, here, is here upstairs. is the uh, the key question, the, the $10,000 question. Was that flannel worn as a shirt or a very heavy belt? Both. Both. Um, hated wearing them as belts. I don't have uh, much in the caboose. And the second I tie Ah, a shirt around my waist, that shit starts falling right the fuck off. (laughs) And that was my 90s, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) I think that was all our 90s. So you met Dandy in college. Yeah, not a lot of bubble butts wearing (laughs) flannel shirts, it turns out. I met Dandy in college. I am a particular individual. And uh, in this particular instance, I was an individual who was not entirely sure how to make friends at college. If you lived in my dorm and your door was cracked, chances are I was going to bust in and say hello at some point, which I did one day. And I found a girl that I had met during freshman orientation and was a little bit keen on. And I found this guy, Andy, who was also a little bit keen on the same girl. And I wanted to hate him. I was just way too enamored with uh, who he was and what he was doing and how excited he was about the things he was talking about. And now the two of you collaborate in theater and other projects? Yeah, we run a theater company together. We've written four full-length shows together, a whole slew of short plays and sketches. I helped him make his cat tower. <laughs> <laughs> He's moving up to Portland. Oh, as all hippies do. As all hippies do. Um, as, and well, as we've been saying lately, when the going gets tough in San Francisco, um, it's not the tough who moved to Portland. But he sure as shit is. Because I'm fucking petty. All right, Beth? You like that? You like that new knowledge about me? Fuck you in this microphone therapy. <laughs> this is dandy. <laughs> Asshole. When I was doing all the drugs, yeah, I mean, I'll give you a... I was geographically in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's a lot nicer now, but it was pretty dank. Literally dank. Yeah. Not, not wet and cold. Yeah, not hippie dank. I mean, like, <laughs> actually, like, wet and cold and unemployed. And I would work three-day shifts and just cut loose for, like, five days after that. Um, I used to drink a bottle of whiskey every single day, and then uh, when I wasn't working, I'd, like, you know, mix it with heroin and whatever else. I'll tell you all about it. Yeah, I keep it to myself because I think people mostly don't want to hear about it, but if, you, if you're if you asking, then yeah, sure. It's I, I was an uncomfortable kid, just naturally uncomfortable. As soon as something turns the volume down on that, you're just like, ah, oh, that's it. Now I can do life. I used to smoke a lot of weed when I was a kid. Like, I'd smoke it all the time. I would sell just enough to keep myself supplied. I'd smoke before school, at lunch. I was also on Ritalin. Shitloads of Ritalin. Mm. Oh my god, you guys. Right now, I think they give adults take like 10 to 15 milligrams. They were giving me 35 three times a day when Damn. I was like. Holy um, shit. When I was like eight and weighed like 100 pounds. Whoa. But like, I had to take it in the morning before I woke up. Really? Yeah, my parents put me on it. I mean, I think they meant well. They, you know, I wasn't doing good in school. I was super hyper and everything. I mean, I wasn't like awful. There was this like two year period where like they were putting all these kids on Ritalin and I mean I, I remember not liking it. I remember I had insomnia constantly. 
So in addition to being kind of weird to begin with, then that's going on. So right, I mean, not sleeping. You're so I'm not sleeping. Always altered. I'm not eating. I have to go to the nurse to eat my lunch because they know I'm not eating. So I'd have oh. to take my lunch into the uh. into the nurse and like eat it in front of her, and I still didn't even want to eat. And whatever. I mean, it wasn't a big deal. I mean, it wasn't. I wasn't completely isolated. You know, I had friends and everything, but I just fucking felt wrong all the time. Yeah, as soon as I had access to booze, like I was, I had the shakes by the time I was like 19. Wow. Yeah. When I was 19 years old, I was the end of my freshman year of college. I was 100% physically dependent on alcohol. And I did okay in my classes. I was functional. And yeah, so I remember I got home and I realized I was like, I drank this six pack and couldn't even feel it. And I was just like, all right, I got to dry out. I, I like locked myself in the room and I, I didn't know it was coming. That was like the first time I like, legit DTs, mm. like D. Tease, actual snakes coming out of the wall like train spotting, oh, like Jesus. Wow. Tees. It was fucking wild, like the worst fever I've ever had. That happened, and that was when I was just like, uh oh, I'm an alcoholic. Just something like that happens. I guess some people can just like denial their way through that. It's like, no, I'm pretty sure most most 19 year olds don't deal with stuff like this. I, I never did the denial thing so I pretty much was just like all right I'm not gonna stop I'm gonna try to make it work so I did for like the next like seven years once I was 21 and like just the hassle was gone out of it I drank a bottle of whiskey every single night like a bottle of whiskey whoa um, yeah I would do one of those just about every day either throughout or before bed and then if I didn't have to work I could like drink like a whole handle so I was always doing that. I moved all around. I did this. I did this. I always worked and, you know, or saved up money and then traveled. And like out in Phoenix, I went on like a binge with Coke too, because it was really cheap and easy. And, yeah, no. And then in Pittsburgh, just one night, I drank my liter of vodka and I just couldn't, I didn't even catch a buzz. Nothing happened. I finished the whole thing and nothing happened. And that was it. That was it. That was, that was the end. This, like, really bad punchline at the end of a long joke. This has more or less ruined my life, which is okay, because I'm happy to do that if I can get drunk. But, like, now you're, you can't even really yeah, rely on and get drunk no. anymore. Yeah, how about that, dude? <laughs> and, and so how old were you at that point? I was 26. Uh, I lived in a halfway house outside of Baltimore for like three months. That's where if you're just out of rehab, but you have nowhere to go, or you're like trying to get out of jail, they'll step you down there. And if you don't, if you can pass your tests, you can get your sentences reduced and stuff like that. And what it basically is, is the worst roommates you can possibly <laughs> ever imagine. <laughs> I'm in there with like 11 other dudes all different ages from all different places. Some of these guys are just like trying to not have to stay in jail. Some of them's parents are making them be there. Some of them are like husbands who are trying to satisfy their wives but have absolutely no interest in sobering up. And I mean, you just live day in and day out with these people and you have to follow all these rules. So you leave, you have to leave with two of them. So we're in this little town outside of Baltimore <laughs> no. of like nice people. Nice people live in this town. Not in these halfway houses, but in in this town it's full of nice people and you'll just see these three miscreants just kind of schlumping through the town <laughs> together and like getting dirty looks from everybody. I mean, I actually wanted to be there. I mean, I was I was legitimately getting my life together. Right. So I wasn't fucking around or arguing with people or breaking rules and stuff. But like you had to like sign in and out. There was a curfew. Um, all you really do is get a job, live at this place, and go to, like, lots and lots and lots of AA meetings. So that's really all it was. There's there's not much else to it than that. Uh, I came out here. Uh, my sister was moving to L.A. because she wanted to be an actress. I came out here to stay with D-Day because I just needed a new place to be. I didn't want to go back to Pittsburgh. Somebody took me to a Thanksgiving dinner on my first day in San Francisco, and it was a bunch of sober guys. And the one of the first things that the first person that I met there told me was that he ran a sober camp at Burning Man. And I was just like, what? And he said, yeah, there's a sober camp at Burning Man. And I had written off the possibility that I would ever go to Burning Man. When you get in early sobriety, I mean, you just, you think your life is over. It's not, right. it's totally not. It's, it's a misconception, but you think it is. To you, for you all intents and purposes, yeah, you think you're never gonna have fun again. You think all the stuff that used to be fun to you is never gonna be fun. You think you're not invited to the cool stuff anymore. It's not true. For anybody who is listening, it is not, 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 not true, but it feels true at the time. 
And this dude was just like, nah, you can go to Burning Man. Yeah, you can come with us. You know, and it was just, I can't even tell you. I melted. <laughs> Being sober at Burning Man? Well, uh, I love it. Um, I'll tell you, you know, for a guy who, who has a, a constant urge to get high, Burning Man is, that is the last place on earth I would ever need something. And it's, I've never once, I mean, don't get me wrong, I get tempted and, you know, I, I have my moments, but it's never once been at Burning Man. Because you're kind of already there, it might not be quite as visual or dramatic, but your head's there already. You're already taking in, in a really big way, all that Burning Man has to offer. You're on the trip. Yeah, for sure. You don't need to, like, make it happen. It's happening. You're there. The big crazy shit's already going on in front of you. and You're, you're inundated in it. You're plugged into this giant mass of people who are all exploding at once, you know what I mean? And if your brain's already plugged into that, it's happening to you. My favorite Burning Man story, it's not a long one, it's very brief, but my very, very favorite thing I think that ever happened was I was just sitting in a lawn chair kind of staring off into the distance in the afternoon and it looked like a pretty calm day to me. There wasn't a dust storm or anything like that. And just way off in the distance, a tent shot straight <laughs> up into the air. Straight up into the air like there was a, a string pulling it up into the sky. Like I, I couldn't believe it. it and it wasn't, this didn't happen in my head. I was completely sober. And this tent just shot up into the air like the Wizard of Oz. I could kind of see stuff falling out of it. Um, and it just kind of went out of view and, and that was it. It was marvelous. It was like getting to see the Northern Lights or something. <laughs> For assholes. <laughs> I saw that happen to an untethered car park. It went up about 15, 20 feet, and then the wind changed, and it came right back down and went through the front windshield of, like, a brand new Jeep. Wow. Yeah, so secure. That's that's what rebar is for kids. That happened to a campmate of mine. It knocked the side view mirror off their rental. Have you ever gotten hurt at Burning Man? I did not get hurt at Burning Man per se. I got hurt at Fourth of Japlaya. I'm actually pretty proud of this. Um, as the only sober person in a camp of 30, like, I hurt myself worse than anybody that week. Nicely done. Okay, can I just claim that nobody should do any of the stuff I'm about to say? Like, like not even for fun. I mean, this is like definitely people who have died at Japlaya from stuff like this and thinking that like... Not even there yet, stuff. just on the way there. On the way there? Oh, and there. All I want to say is like, respect the limitations of vehicles when you're out on the playa when nobody's around. You're not oh, yeah. in a car commercial. Cars roll a lot easier than you think they do. That's all I want to say before I actually tell this story and, and somebody thinks it's funny and actually does it. Uh, here's how I almost died. So, me and my buddy Mikey are out, we're driving his truck just kind of out in deep playa. This is during 4th of July, which if you don't know is kind of an informal thing. We're just out there deep driving and like we got, I want to say we got it going up to like 30 and... It's like a little pickup, like a Toyota? It's a little Toyota pickup, like a four banger. This is back when like ghost riding was getting really big in <laughs> Oakland. So it started off, we were like sitting on the, the windows. Like hanging out the window and then we're, you know, two dudes and we're kind of daring each other and then we got up like onto the roof. And we're up on top of the roof of this car going pretty fast out there and there was another car behind us and we were dancing around like looking at the car behind us like, woo! My girlfriend was back there looking at me making awful, awful faces. <laughs> but, but we were doing it. We were killing it. Like we were surfing on top of a car going way, way, way too fast. What is keeping the gas on? Huh? What is keeping the gas on? No, that it's just going. Um, there's nothing to stop it's it. We just flat. got it going really fast and like and it just kept out. going and then we just climbed out. I, he might have put it in neutral, I don't know. And then he jumped back into the car and kicked the wheel on his way in. <gasps> and uh, yeah, man, I was up there and I will tell you, I always, always, always wanted to know, okay, you know how time dilation happens? I had the time to sit there and actually say to myself, 
this is what you're going to do, Andy. Like, I've always <laughs> wanted to know. You're going to run really, really fast when you hit the ground, and we're just going to see if you can, like, fucking run it out. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the car went out from under me. I was in midair, and I was just like, run. Just run as soon as you hit the ground. Run as soon as you hit the ground. And I hit the ground. And I took two steps and just <laughs> oh. flattened right the fuck out and like bounced up off the ground and hit again and bounced up off the ground and hit again and just kind of like skid out the you can actually known as crashing and burning yeah I, i'm trying to think you can oh, still yeah you shit. can still kind of see it all right you see this this coloration uh -huh. right here uh -huh. that's what that's from nice yep. uh -huh. yeah I, I i've had a series of ludicrous accidents in my life and i just i seem to I tend to bounce right. <laughs> <laughs> Accuracy Third is distributed under the Creative Commons license. We're engineered and edited by Drunk Beth, and sometimes by D-Day, and produced by Accuracy Third, which is Drunk Beth, D-Day, and Rex. Our theme music is by Jim and Damien. The music you've been listening to on this episode is by Wildlife Control. Except for the music in the introduction, which is clearly made in GarageBand. <laughs> who you can find on the internet at wildlifectrl.com. You can find us on the internet at accuracythird.com and on various legacy social media sites that have been around for more than a year or two because we are way too old to be on Snapchat.